we can talk a little bit about viruses in general. A lot of the times people are kind of like, well, you know, what's a virus? What's a bacteria? And I thought we could start just with a little bit of basic science about viruses and bacteria, which are, you know, the main things we talk about. There's certainly other kinds of infections, such as fungal infections that are serious as well. It has a lot of implications for um, how we treat certain infections and, of course, the growing problem of resistant uh, bacteria, antibiotic resistant bacteria, because of sort of the overuse of antibiotics. Start out by asking the question, what is a virus? And they're interesting, and there's literally billions of them, or trillions, really. But what it is, is just an infectious particle. And it can only reproduce by actually commandeering or taking over a host cell and using that host cell's machinery to make more viruses. So whether the host is human or animal, it can't make copies of itself on its own. So it needs to get in somewhere and borrow that machinery to make more copies of itself. And really all it does is a very simple DNA or RNA inside a little shell called a capsid. And some viruses do have envelopes on the outside which they also borrow from their host cells, but they're extremely diverse. They have different shapes and structures, different genomic makeup, and they infect all kinds of different hosts, you know, all kinds of different animals as well as humans. They reproduce by infecting their host cells and reprogramming those cells to just become little virus-making factories. Very clever. They can't do this on their own, but they're not considered living organisms, unlike bacteria, which are really living organisms. Here's a few of the shapes that they can come in, but they all have this basic genome in the middle, the RNA or DNA that uh, is what does the work. And then they have this capsid outside and sometimes a, an envelope protein on the outside as well. So adenovirus is a common cold virus. This is the influenza virus is more spherical. So there's all kinds of different shapes and sizes, but we do know that they cause all kinds of different types of infections. In the winter, we're mostly uh, talking about respiratory infections such as the common cold, which most common colds are caused by something called rhinovirus, but there are many, many viruses that cause cold-like symptoms, obviously COVID-19, influenza, RSV, which we'll talk more about, and then something called para-influenza that can be a lot like the flu, human metanumovirus. So all these are viruses that can give us respiratory symptoms, but there are also, I'm sure some of you have been hearing about the digestive system infections. Norovirus is something that has been around for a long time. And like a lot of things, once we sort of developed a good test for it, we're able to sort of know more about the prevalence of it. But norovirus is sort of the famous cruise ship virus, highly, highly, highly transmissible. There have been all kinds of experiments where, not to be too gross, but, you know, they've had someone, you know, for instance, who vomited in, on an airplane, and then they can measure, you know, how far away people are and how likely they are to get infected. But it's incredibly infectious. You can get it from contaminated food and so forth. And it's been very big this winter and is still going around here in the Northeast. And typically it's diarrhea, but also can cause nausea and vomiting. And it's self-limited. We don't really have a treatment for it. And rotavirus is something that affects kids typically. And of course, hepatitis, all the different kinds. Then these viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, which is probably the most famous, but dengue, which has been mostly in the Southern hemisphere, but as climate change takes hold, we may start seeing dengue creep north and yellow fever in countries in Africa and South America. Lots of viral sexually transmitted infections, HIV, obviously, human papillomavirus, which is the cause of cervical and anal cancer and genital warts. Herpes simplex virus, the hepatitis can, can be sexually transmitted. And then more recently, mpox, originally known as monkeypox, which has been endemic in Africa. But for the first time, really, we had a big outbreak last year. And that's a so-called orthopox virus, very similar to smallpox. And then there are rash-causing viruses that we all know about, chickenpox, measles, fifth disease in kids, neurologic infections like West Nile virus, which over the last several years has been endemic to New York, polio, rabies, and then some congenital infections like Zika, which again cropped up a few years back. So lots and lots of different types of viral infections. And how do you get them? Obviously, it's sort of coughing, sneezing, close contact. Some viruses you're more likely to get by, you know, touching a, a door 
doorknob that someone who was sick touched. Others are more respiratory. COVID is more pure respiratory, not so much touching things. But a lot of these wintertime viruses, you can just get by contaminated objects. Obviously, sexual transmission. Some viral infections are transmitted by the bite of an infected animal, such as a mosquito or a tick, and then from eating contaminated food or contaminated water. How do we prevent them? You know, vaccines are really um, at the top of the list. And, you know, it's discouraging. There's sort of uh, a movement now away from vaccines. We're starting to see measles outbreaks. And some of that is because of the perception that measles is no big deal, but it really can be a very big deal. And before the measles vaccine, lots and lots of kids died of measles. You know, often it's very mild in kids, but it can be very serious. And in adults, it can be extremely serious with measles, pneumonia, and eye infections infections. So vaccines are really at the top of the list. We have lots of different vaccines for RSV, obviously flu, COVID, chickenpox, measles, mumps, and rubella, polio, hepatitis, A and B, not for C yet, human papillomavirus, meningococcal meningitis, shingles. So all these things, meningococcal meningitis actually is a bacterial infection, but uh, shingles, wash your hands a lot, mask if you're sick or around sick people, safe food habits, you know, cooking your meat to the right temperature, storing food properly, washing your vegetables, condoms or dental dams during sex, protecting yourself from bug bites. You know, West Nile virus is a mosquito-borne disease here in New York. Obviously, stay away from wild or aggressive animals. There is rabies uh, still around. And stay away from people if you're sick. There are certain viral infections where you can get post-exposure prophylaxis, much as we talk about with HIV. If you don't have immunity to certain things like chicken and pox or hepatitis B or rabies, certainly, or HIV, you can get treatments that will diminish your chances of actually developing disease. So there are a lot of ways these days that we can prevent them. And there are ways that we can treat them. When I first started my career, there were not a lot of antivirals. But as time has gone on, we have more and more antivirals for things like flu, which the benefits of treating flu are relatively modest. But if you really start the treatment early in the disease, it'll shorten the disease and perhaps reduce the chance of hospitalization. Obviously, COVID-19, we have Paxlovid and other antivirals. Hepatitis B and C, we have excellent treatments now. HIV, Mpox, there's a treatment called Tecabiramat which was originally for smallpox that seemed to have some pretty good effectiveness. And there's ongoing trials looking at that. Herpes simplex and herpes zoster, we have treatments and immunomodulators for human papillomavirus and then treatments for both preventing and treating CMV. So there's a lot more antivirals now than we used to have. So there are definitely things we can do. So how do they differ from bacteria? Well, as I mentioned, bacteria are microscopic living organisms. They have only one cell. There are millions, if not billions, of different types of bacteria that can be found all over the world and including all over our bodies. They're all over our skin, they're in our airways, they're in our mouth throughout our digestive system, reproductive system, and urinary tract, we probably have 10 times more bacterial cells than we do have human cells in our bodies. But many of them serve a beneficial purpose, although some can cause disease. And the bacteria that live on our skin, for instance, can cause skin infections if they you know, get in through a cut. If the balance of bacteria in your gut gets upset, you can have an overgrowth of certain bacteria that can cause diseases. So it's all a balance that we call the microbiome. Bacteria can also be found all over the world in soil, water, plants, animals, radioactive waste. They've been found in Arctic ice and glaciers and in hot springs. They're way up in the air, uh, up to 30,000 feet and down in the ocean depths. So bacteria are everywhere. They differ from, from viruses and they're actually living organisms that can reproduce themselves. You know, it can be hard to tell when something is a viral infection versus a bacterial infection, but the vast majority of respiratory infections that we all experience in the wintertime are viral infections. Now, we don't always go and get tested for these, although we have PCR tests that can do a panel of sort of 15 to 20 different viruses, but you, you're really only going to get that test if you, you go to the emergency room or you go to the doctor, and often it's not necessary. But bacterial infections can cause, you know, similar symptoms, the cough, the fever, the aches. But the key thing is that antibiotics don't help treat viral infections. Antibiotics really only work for bacteria. And then, as we mentioned, antivirals can treat viral infections for those that we do have antivirals for. And so, you know, more and more, we do have the ability to test. I mean, obviously, the home COVID test is a big breakthrough. And if we had home flu tests, 
you know, that would be perhaps even better, you know, sometimes for us as physicians, when patients call us and, you know, we get a lot of calls during the winter with similar symptoms and it can be hard to really sort out. We try to discourage overusing antibiotics because that really can and is leading to resistant bacteria. And we have a harder and harder time finding antibiotics that will work. So I think as time goes on, the holy grail is really sort of trying to find a simple test that differentiates between a viral and a bacterial infection. But for now, a lot of times we'll sort of tell folks to kind of hang in there and use over-the-counter medication and let time do its thing. If you have a viral infection that's going to last five days and clear itself without treatment, but you start an antibiotic on the first day and you get better in five days, there's an association while the antibiotic is what cured it, but it may have just been a coincidence. So this can be a tricky problem. And there are certain situations where absolutely, even if, you know, we think it may be a viral infection in folks that have underlying lung disease, asthma, emphysema, that we may go ahead and do antibiotics in any case. So that doesn't turn into anything worse. So respiratory syncytial virus has sort of been in the news the last couple of years. And really it's more been in the news just because they came up with the vaccine for it. It's discovered in 1956. So it's been around and, you know, it was obviously around even before then. It's been around for a long time. But what's so dangerous with RSV particularly is in very, very young kids. So that's who we worry about the most. And that's what's always been the biggest issue because we don't really have any good treatments for it. You can get really severe infection in young babies, especially premature babies. And then also in people who are older, have other comorbidities like heart and lung disease or uh, are immunocompromised. In most people, RSV symptoms are just like every other cold virus. You get cough, fever, stuffy, runny nose, lack of appetite and you just sort of take care of yourself, get through it. But it's really the very young and the very old that we worry about. So they did develop two vaccines last year in 2023 was the first year that they were available. One by a company, GlaxoSmithKline called Arexv, and one by the company Pfizer called Abrisvo. That is the one that is recommended for pregnant women. Both vaccines have just a little part of the RSV virus in it, and they cause an immune response that can protect you from the rest respiratory disease um, if you're infected with RSV in the future. So for the 60 and older crowd, it's sort of right now a recommendation that you discuss it with your healthcare provider. Not everyone necessarily needs an RSV vaccine, even at that age. But if you have other conditions that might cause you to have more severe disease, it's probably a good idea. It's looking like the RSV vaccine might last two years. So that would be a good thing if we didn't have to do that every year. But it's something to think about. I know we're all a little vaccine weary, but you know, the older you get, and I'll show a slide later, the more at risk you are. So staying protected, really vaccines are the best way. In the studies, they were really very, very effective in adults 60 years and older who had healthy immune systems. One dose of Orexv was 83% effective in preventing lung infections like pneumonia um, during the first season after the vaccination. And during the second season, they still had protection up to 56%. The other their vaccine, Abrisvo, was also highly effective, 89%. They're still looking in the second season as to how well that's going to work. So these vaccines, although like all vaccines, and we kind of learned this with COVID, there aren't too many vaccines that are 100% effective, but what they are good at is preventing more serious infections and making the course of the disease more mild. So something to think about. But where there's really um, been a breakthrough is with RSV immunization for children 19 months and younger. It's it's not a prototypical vaccine. You can tell when anything ends in an AB, it usually signifies that it's a monoclonal antibody. And so we had some of those monoclonal antibody infusions for a while with COVID. They're designed to neutralize the virus. And so nirosivimab is this monoclonal antibody for RSV. And it's recommended for any infants that are younger than eight months of age who were born during or are entering their first RSV season. So, you know, that would be sort of fall and winter, only if the mother didn't receive a vaccine during pregnancy. So remember, one of those vaccines is eligible for women during pregnancy. If the mother got vaccinated, then the child's likely going to be protected. So, but you will administer this if, if you don't know 
know if the mom's been vaccinated or if the infant was born within 14 days of the maternal vaccination. But most infants whose mothers got the vaccine won't need to get this as well. And then in the slightly older age group, young children 8 through 19 months of age who are at increased risk for severe disease, so immune compromised, cystic fibrosis, other populations, they should probably get this for the start of the second RSV season. So this has really been pretty dramatic in terms of decreasing because these young kids could get very, very sick and be in the hospital for quite a while with RSV. So this is a real breakthrough for that age group. And it's just administered as a shot into the thigh muscle. It's one dose. There was a little bit of a, a supply issues this season. Hopefully that'll get worked out uh, and it'll be more widely available. It also reduces the risk of disease, severe disease by about 80%. And one dose will protect infants for about five months, which is about how long the RSV season lasts. It's not like a vaccine. It's not activating the immune system. It's really just this monoclonal antibody that's circulating in the body for a while. So it's most effective right after it's given and then can kind of diminish with time. But it doesn't give you long-term protection. Again, it's really for the at-risk infants to get at a young age. But fortunately, as kids get older, they're more likely just to have cold symptoms from it. So it's not something they'll have to do in an ongoing way until you get to age 60 when we start talking about the vaccine again. So that was sort of the big news with RSV last year. In terms of the flu, just showing you update from the New York State Department of Health website. These are the last few years. I always like to point out this was COVID lockdown year where we basically had no flu whatsoever. It was pretty astonishing. And then the year after that, we had a little minimal bump in December and then a little bit more later on in the season. And now we're returning more to typical flu seasons as people aren't, you know, masking as much. The vaccine was pretty effective this year. You know, it's always a bit of a guessing game. But the red line is this season. We had a peak in late December and it's been slowly trailing down, but there is definitely still flu around. So it's never too late to get the flu shot. And even if you get a flu shot late in the season, it can help you protect you for next year as well. This is all three of the major viral infections starting March of last year and going to March of this year. The red line was COVID. We had that late summer increase. And then we had a peak in uh, late December, early January. It's definitely been coming down. Flu is the blue line here also coming down and RSV is at very low levels until it started picking up in the fall, predictably uh, peaked around December and now is going down as well. So we're getting towards the end of the viral respiratory infection season, but this year was a pretty typical season in New York. This is just a slide showing the risk of death from respiratory diseases. And just, you know, to point out that the older you get, the more at risk you are. So, you know, up into your 80s, you have a tenfold higher risk of influenza causing you serious problems compared to younger years. And the same is true for COVID and other diseases. So that's where vaccines uh, can really play a role. I just thought this was interesting. This is sort of over time, even though the number of people age 65 and over has increased since 1960 to the present day, the flu mortality has declined over time and the peaks are getting a little bit smaller. So I think that speaks to our more success with vaccines and some of the antivirals we have. But flu, historically, there have been some, some real pandemics. The Russian flu, so-called Russian flu in the 1889 and 1990, probably killed anywhere up to 5 million. And then the Spanish flu, which was end of World War One through 1920, there there are various estimates, but the high estimates were perhaps as many as 100 million deaths. You know, really three to 5% of the worldwide population died from the Spanish flu. And, and this, interestingly, was a flu that affected younger people, probably because they hadn't been exposed to this particular strain of flu growing up. That was the last really big one, but there have been other pandemics in the 50s, 60s, even in 2009. But a typical season, this is worldwide. We still see, you know, 300,000 to 500,000 deaths from flu. So it's not a trivial disease. And again, vaccines can really go a long way to decreasing risk of serious illness and death. So it's good to get that flu vaccine every year.
year. The universal vaccine, a so-called universal vaccine. Right now, we just have these seasonal vaccines. And every year, they sort of see what's happening in Asia at the beginning of the year, and they make their best guess as to what the flu strains are going to be. And then they have to go into production, and they use chicken eggs to develop the vaccines. It's labor-intensive. You can get mutations when they grow in the chicken eggs. So every year, it's this huge rush to guess what's going to be circulating in the fall here and producing enough vaccines to give to folks. So they have made progress in developing so-called universal vaccines using multiple strains and parts of the virus in one vaccine. And some of the newer mRNA technology that was developed for COVID vaccines could someday mean that you need only one vaccine and it'll be the same vaccine every year and you may not even need it every year. And I think that, you know, there's some optimism that that can happen in the next few years. But for now, get your flu vaccine each year, especially if you're older or have other health problems. Lastly, just talking about COVID, we just passed sort of the fourth anniversary of COVID. It's hard to believe. It's had a huge impact on everyone's lives and still continues to in many ways that we're probably not even aware of. But it's estimated that 30 million lives were lost to COVID over this time. And it really was the biggest drop in life expectancy globally in the last 50 years, just from this one virus alone. But we have very, 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 very good evidence that COVID death rates and the incidence of long COVID are significantly lower in the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. And it's really not even a question at this point. We know that the COVID vaccines um, will protect you from more serious illness and also protect you from developing long COVID. And they also prevent some of the cardiovascular events that we've seen with COVID, like pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis, clots in the leg, strokes. So so they really are quite protective. Paxlovid is kind of underused, you know, in part because, you know, it went from being free and provided by the government to being, you know, covered by insurance now. So accessibility may be a little bit more challenging for some folks, but it does work well. It does reduce your risk of hospitalization and death. In folks under 50, it probably doesn't make too much of a difference. But again, the older you get, the more I would think about um, using Paxlovid in addition to decreasing hospitalization and death can decrease the incidence of long COVID. So that's something really to think about in a five-day course. Just to talk about, you know, this sort of made the news in the last couple of weeks or so. The CDC came out with new recommendations for isolation and what they are trying to do. And I think this is well-meaning. I think they're sort of trying to normalize, if you will, COVID and put it into the category of other respiratory viruses like RSV, like flu, like some of the other ones we talked about and sort of say, here's a one size fits all. This is what we should do for all respiratory infections. So on March 1st, they said that people can, quote, return to normal activities when for at least 24 hours, the symptoms are improving. Okay, they don't have to have gone away completely. And if a fever was present, it's been gone without the use of fever reducing medication like Tylenol. So that means people can go back to work, go about their business. What do they mean by symptoms improving? There's some local health departments that have tried to be a little more precise about it. They sort of say that it's when you're no longer feeling ill and you can do your daily routine just as before you were ill and any remaining symptoms are mild or infrequent. So you might have a little cough, you, know, you might be a little more tired than usual, but overall you're feeling much better. However, you should still be cautious for at least five more days and that includes wearing a mask. And certainly if you're going to go visit someone you know, who's elderly or at high risk, you should test yourself if you can to make sure that you test negative for COVID before you expose other folks. So this was sort of a compromise. On the criticism side, you can say it's capitalism at work. They just want people to get back to work and not give people flex time and paid time off for illness. You know, there are some epidemiologists who feel that it is good to have a clear, consistent message that's consistent with other respiratory illnesses. And truly, we are in an era right now at this moment where there is a lower risk of severe disease. Most people in the United States have either had COVID or been vaccinated. So unless you're in a high risk group, it probably makes some sense as long as people are sensible and try to be cautious. You know, the arguments against it are that we do know for sure 
aware that one out of every three people are still transmitting COVID five days after symptom onset. So that five days never made that much sense anyway. And there are people who argue that you should wait to return to work until you test negative on an antigen test. But I think the horse is out of the barn. I think this is where we are right now. We're telling folks that if you're feeling better, you know, put a mask on and you can sort of get back to what you're doing. One prominent epidemiologist really came out in favor of changing these. They say that the CDC really did their homework, that they did a lot of modeling. They used testing data from over 600 people and compared it to the old guidance. And they actually found that there wasn't that much difference in onward transmission. And part of the reason is that because more than half of COVID-19 transmissions, so I get COVID-19, more than half of the people that I'm going to give it to are, I gave it to them when I didn't have any symptoms. That was always the thing that made COVID spread so much was that it's a disease unlike other diseases where it was spreading before people had symptoms. And so that's why they feel that most of that transmission takes place then. And in those who have symptoms, most of the onward transmission happens in the first three days. So they use the word most. That doesn't mean that people aren't getting it later on. But California and Oregon did change their guidelines a while back, and they haven't found any big change in the numbers of cases or hospitalizations. So that's reassuring. Surveys found that most people do stay home while they're sick with COVID-19, um, although about 27% don't isolate at all when they're sick. This is Caitlin Jetalina, who's your local epidemiologist. She has a blog and sends out a newsletter. She thinks that in the end, this update won't greatly impact net community transmission. She believes that it will help encourage people who were doing nothing or not isolating and not doing anything to sort of now do something. But we'll see. But that's where we are. The arguments are against are sort of what will people hear with these guidelines? They might focus on fever without paying attention to all the other instructions about symptoms improving. Are people going to keep a mask on for an additional five days or so after they return to their you know normal business? And what will businesses do? This gives employers a reason not to be as flexible and to kind of insist that people come back to work sooner. So again, one in three people are still going to be infectious in five days after symptom onset. And so some epidemiologists argue that we should be continuing to isolate until rapid tests are negative. All this is, you know, particularly if you're around people who are at high risk, but that's the new guidance. And it's putting us into this new era, I think, of an attempt at sort of normalizing COVID and saying it's a little bit like everything else. And I don't think it is completely. I mean, you know, we still do have folks who are at risk for getting long COVID and more severe disease. And, and it really puts an onus on the immunocompromised and people with disabilities to keep themselves safe. So I don't think it's perfect, but that's where we are in terms of new guidance. What else is new in the COVID world? CDC come out, it was kind of didn't make much of a splash. They said, well, there was a recommendation for a monovalent vaccine. You guys might remember that we had the bivalent vaccine a year or so ago. This fall, they recommended the monovalent vaccine targeted against the strain that was circulating. And they said, if you're over 60, you can consider getting another one this spring. Uh, I'm not finding a lot of takers. I'm not even sure if I'm going to do it. I don't know. There's going to be another one in the fall, but it's out there as a recommendation if you're over 60. And, you know, again, particularly if you're at higher risk for serious disease and you happen to be a vaccine fan, some people are on their sixth, seventh, or eighth vaccines now. There was that article in the newspaper of a fellow in Germany who, for some odd reason, got 274 vaccines or something. But I think people are getting a little bit weary, and I do feel we may settle into uh, a routine of vaccines in the fall. And as we saw by those curves, COVID is diminishing now. We're beginning to understand long COVID a little bit better, but we're still a long way from fully understanding it and having good treatment. But there are a lot of ongoing studies and there are a lot of people who've been affected by this. So it's really, really important. You know, I think more money is going into studying that. Right now, the dominant strain has been pretty stable for a while. There's some variants out there that could cause trouble that they're keeping a close eye on, but there's nothing really new or dangerous on the rising. People aren't testing a lot anymore. So wastewater tracking has become a 
important you know it's a way to keep track of not just covid but lots of other viruses and so that's become a, a tool that's used to sort of anticipate peaks our hospital here and some other hospitals i think are sort of doing this red yellow green based on community prevalence i think right now we're in yellow which means you know we're encouraged to wear masks for patient care but visitors don't have to wear a mask if they don't want to we were in red a few weeks ago and that was you know all visitors needed to be masked and we needed to be masked for patient care and i suppose we might get to green where that will be no masks required although some people may continue to still wear masks they're trying to implement more sensible recommendations that we can kind of shift based on prevalence and again a plug for vaccination and i think the last slide i had was just to show here are the common symptoms of flu and rsv and covid19 and you know, it's a little hard to pick anything out that would tell you, but I guess when we have people with severe aches, body aches, that's often suggestive of flu. Fever chills might be a little more suggestive of flu versus COVID and RSV. But there's nothing that really stands out, maybe a little more cough and wheezing with RSV. It's pretty hard to tell. I mean, you can have any of these symptoms, and some of it is based on just what's circulating. If we know we're in a heavy flu period and people call up with classic symptoms, often we'll just tell them to go ahead and get on treatment without even testing or having them come in. But I'm not sure these charts are very helpful in telling you because really uh, all those symptoms are so similar.